to Friday's High Noon Club. Jimmy Martin, how you doing, buddy? How are you? Uh, power to the people. You're the, you're the leader. You're the leader, man. Yeah, yeah we got a weak leader. We got a weak, weak leader. If I'm the leader. Sure. I'd like to welcome everyone to Friday's High Noon Club. If you're a first time visitor, would you raise your hand for us? Hey, thank you very much for coming. You're always welcome. High Noon Club, free deal. Free. Freedom of speech. Free. High Noon Club, free. And what hopefully we get to do is we get to become friends down here. We get to talk and debate on both sides, of the, all sides of the issue. And hopefully nobody gets mad and runs away sad. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to almost get to a place where I can imitate Jesse Jackson. See if I'm kind of there's a little rhythm to the nonsense. But anyway, let's start out. Every high noon club meeting starts out with an opening prayer and a pledge of allegiance to the American flag. Pastor Steve Kerr, Dr. Steve Kerr, all of that Baptist Church will do our opening prayer, and then I'll lead the pledge of allegiance to the American flag. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity to be here once again today to enjoy the uh, fellowship and uh, the friendship. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we enjoy, that we're able to express by, by meeting here together today. We just pray your, your blessings on our time together. Help us to be informed. And Lord, help us to be willing to do what we need to be doing to protect that freedom. We do pray for our, our military and those in harm's way. For our leadership, Lord, there's a, a lot of things going on in the world today that's very dangerous. We pray, Father, for wisdom. We do pray for our nation. We pray that you will bring an awakening, an outpouring of your spirit through your mercy and forgiveness. So, Lord, we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. This afternoon, high noon, we're going to be very blessed to have our guest speaker present a his little discussion and talk to us and give us some information. Patrick Wigan from Oklahoma Capitol Beat. Pat is one of these guys that's been around, not because he, because he's a very young man, but he's just been around the block several different times. <laughs> Washington, D.C. and Pat. And what's very interesting about Pat, he's the only man that I know, that I personally know, that was mentioned in Clarence, Clarence, Supreme Court Clarence Thomas' book. So, very impressive. And, uh, Clarence Thomas, as most of you may know or may not know, is one of my very favorite Supreme Court justices. The, but anyway, uh, great to have Pat here. Thanks so much for coming, Pat. We've got several people, I believe, in, in the audience this, this afternoon that are running for a public office. So raise your hands and I'll get around to you. And you'll have somewhere around 30 seconds to tell us exactly why you're running for these offices. How many people in the room are perfect? <laughs> Okay, we've we got one perfect, Mike Reynolds, represent Mike Reynolds, he's perfect, okay, he's perfect, he's number two, perfect, okay, yeah, because that's what we got to do as a party, and as a, and a state, and, and also as a country, we've got to find our common ground that we agree with, rather than being always negative on this side, because negativity, not going to win anything, we're going to lose every time. Any other announcements, meeting announcements, right here. And then we'll be there. Hi, I'm Don. Each of us have a debt per citizen of $193,166 as of last night. Good inheritance you all are giving your kids, your grandkids. Okay, our candidates. And if you're a candidate run for some public office, raise your hand and give us your little accountability of why somebody in this room would want to vote for you. You've got 30 seconds, okay? Let me go right here and then you'll be next. Thank you. I get to hold the microphone. Uh, my name is Eric Wyatt. I'm running for the United States Senate against Senator Inhofe. And a couple of the reasons why I'm very, I'm a very strong advocate of term limits, both at the state level, which we got passed through, as well as the federal level. 
We also need to go ahead and get rid of this hideous thing with the Department of Edu Education at the federal level and restore that stuff back to the state levels. And that's one of my big deals. I have a two-year-old, I have a seven-year-old, so I'm very vested in that issue particularly. We also need to go ahead and continue shrinking the federal government and give more power back to the states. It's getting abused and we need to take care of it and end it now. And I do have flyers, I do have business cards on the tables. Please take some, get in touch with me. I'll be more than happy to talk with any of you. Thank you. Next. I'm going I'm to get you over here so everybody can kind of see it better. Make it a little bit better for you. Hi, my name is Kevin Crow. I'm also running for the U.S. Senate. I'm running for the uh, Senate seat that will be vacated by Tom Coburn. Um, one of my main objectives is I want to make sure that Oklahomans have the right to determine their own future and that those decisions are not made in Washington. One of the mistakes that a lot of so-called conservatives make nowadays is, is they seek solutions in Washington. Let me give you an example. I'll use one example and then I'll shut up. The example I'm looking at, how many of you, how many of you remember the Defense of Marriage Act? How many? You remember? Now the idea sounded like a good idea, right? We need, to, we need to defend traditional marriage. The problem was, the problem was this. We looked for a Washington solution. And so even though the idea sounded good, once you've allowed Washington the ability to decide that question, that's going to backfire on you. Because as soon as you get an Obama in the White House, he's going to take that same power and he's going to turn it against you. We need to always defend these decisions at the state level. As for term limits, no, no, we're cutting at the end. I'm formed to. In fact, I will, if I win this time, served out two years, I'll only serve the, the uh, I'll only run one more time. So I will serve no more than eight years. You have my pledge on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other candidates? Okay. Here we go. All right, I'm uh, Chris Kennedy. I'm going to try to fill the shoes. I said tracks are not perfect of... Uh, Representative Reynolds, uh, I'll do my best. But I, uh, I served 10 years in the Marine Corps. I got hurt. I came home, moved back to Oklahoma because I wanted to raise my kids here because uh, Oklahoma has a true moral compass that I wanted to, to get my kids back to. I was raised here. Listen, I, I spent 10 years in the Marine Corps. I saw government waste. I saw the infiltration of federal government, and I, I absolutely despised it. I saw money wasted on a daily basis, millions upon millions of dollars. I believe that we're on the right track because of the work of people like Representative Reynolds uh, for doing what we need to do for our state. But the biggest thing from my perspective is to keep Washington out and we do what we need to do here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hold on. Richard Perchansky, I'm running for Oklahoma governor. One reason I threw my hat into this uh, race is because Mary Fallon said she would do everything in her power to prevent legalization of marijuana. To me, marijuana is an individual liberty uh, issue, and liberty is one of my top priorities. I want you to be free as you can be, and I will be doing mostly on issues of liberty, liberty, liberty. Thank you. Next, can we get over here? And I know we got one up front. Okay, while I'm not running for office, I am here supporting the insurance commissioner, John Doak. I'm his campaign manager. He's running for re-election this time. Uh, he's uh, combating Obamacare both on the state level and nationally, uh, being on several national news syndicates as well as uh, the Heritage Foundation, etc. Um, I, I think we've all, you know, we all remember the, uh, the SEPSI insurance department took after the uh, May tornadoes. They've helped process over 100,000 claims uh, you know, for, uh, for folks in uh, not only in Moore but around the state. And also, he's a very big proponent of limited government, returning $17 million of the appropriated funds that the legislature gave him back to the state. And so uh, I have some flyers back here if you guys want some. I've also got bumper stickers. So thank you. Okay. One up front. You're going to hold it, right? Steve. I'm Steve, and I'm running for District 40, Senate District 40 here in Oklahoma City. And... Um, my theme is uh, restoring the republic to the public. I'm concerned about uh, special interest groups having a lot of control in the Senate. That's one of my uh, pet peeves. Uh, also, I want to keep Oklahoma being Oklahoma. We need to maintain our values. We need to maintain the kind of uh, uh, 
economic um, growth that we're doing. We can do a lot better, I think. But uh, anyway, cut taxes, and uh, I'm very much in favor of uh, free enterprise. Okay. I'm going to tell you, get, get yourself ready for a treat. Again, I believe uh, our guest speaker is going to give you a lot of good information and have some fun doing it. And after that, he's got as much time he wants to talk. You can ask him questions, whatever. So prepare your minds for some of the questions later on. Pat, Pat McGuigan from OK Capital. And Pat, what we can do. Okay. All right. This reminds me of the last time. It's the most conservative room I've been in since the last time I had dinner with Jesse Helms. <laughs> Jesse always had a, a way of kind of clarifying things, sort of like Mike sometimes does on the floor of the house. And uh, <laughs> uh, I remember I worked for Paul Wyrick for 10 years in Washington. It was one of the most invaluable things that ever happened in my life. So many of you will remember Paul, the head of the Free Congress Foundation before that he founded the Heritage. And um, real early on in my Washington experience, you know, I got very familiar with the diversity in conservative ranks. And I don't mean anything other than just differences of opinion on that. And I was kind of perplexed because, I mean, I had a couple of folk really hitting Wyrick hard and hitting me hard. And he goes, Pat, you got to remember this is Washington. And it reminds me of the old story when I first came here back in the 60s. There were two old boys sitting at dinner, they were talking. One guy looked at the other guy and he said, you know, the conservative movement's gone to hell. There's only two true conservatives left, me and you. And I'm not so sure about you. <laughs> so what I always do at things like this is tell you what I've been working on, give you a snapshot, and then I'll take any questions that you've got. And I'm a state guy. I <clears throat> read voraciously, and probably a quarter or less of my writing is on national issues, but three quarters is right here at home. So that's my strength, and that's what I'll talk about, but I can comment or give you reflections on the national issues. Um, first of all, the name is, uh, I'm, I know everybody says this to you, but I think it's the, maybe the second greatest of the old westerns is High Noon, and the greatest is Shane. And uh, I uh, won, believe it or not, a journalism writing award once for my reflections on Shane and the meaning of, uh, you know, somebody better, as Shane goes over that hill, somebody better show back up in the valley with a gun because, uh, as the movie demonstrates, when he sets his gun aside is when everything goes to hell. And uh, great lines in that movie, like the discussion between him and the uh, Marion, uh, the wife, the, the woman that he's obviously attracted to, but you know, that was a different era, it was very righteous the way they conducted their relationship. And he says to her, Marion, a gun, remember Alan Ladd's line, a gun's just tool, no better or worse than the man who uses the tool. Well, you encounter that a lot in politics. A lot of these things we get real upset about, it's true, we could improve processes, but the processes of government, processes of government, are tools. We can improve them, we can make them more efficient, we can reform them, but at the end of the day, uh, who has their hands on the levers of power is very important. So I'm going to talk first about the Common Core. And I will tell you that I've had an instinct about this issue for a long time, which was that about the time everybody was saying it was settled, it seemed pretty clear to me that it wasn't. And they proved that again on Monday with uh, several hundred people at the Capitol working on their legislators. And my most recent writings on this, I think this is another sign of saliency, if you will, because the most recent stuff I've done on this is all over the planet, online. That's kind of exciting, you know, if you're a journalist and a writer. But the uh, politichicks, you know, politichicks picked uh, mm -hmm. up a story that uh, an Oklahoma lady did 
and then uh, that, that group of five folks on Fox, I really don't watch a lot of television, even though I do News 9, but that group of five on Fox, they picked it up and put it on their website. Man, I'm getting hits from all over the place. And what I said, the only uh, reflection I'll give you that distills my personal opinion on the issue without getting into the uh, details of the curriculum itself, because I'm an old curriculum director at an alternative school here in Oklahoma City, Seaworth. I taught there for two years. I ran the curriculum. When you pick curriculum, you're making choices, you know, and your colleagues, the idea is to try to implement the curriculum. But there's a lot of criticisms that can be made, the main one being the presumption that one size fits all and that this can be done from Washington. And what I said recently that the one that's getting played over and over and over again on the internet, which is going to help draw a bullseye on my chest, is uh, when you have a coalition that ranges, on the one hand, from Jeff Hickman, all the way over to, on the other hand, Joe Dorman, and a whole lot of people in between, you're not wearing tinfoil hats, and you're not looking for black helicopters. You're part of a coalition that is expressive of deep concern and commitment by the majority of people who have been watching the issue in the state of Oklahoma. I think that's what's going on with Common Core. I don't know how it turns out. You know, it remember status quo, if nothing ultimately passes, the status quo stays in place and that's still our state curriculum. So, uh, but the debate at the legislature is between repeal and significant reform of Common Core. That is very dramatic. There's only a few states that that's probably true of. And right now, in Oklahoma, it's the most salient of the states. All right. Tax cuts. Will there be any? Well, I remember when Mary Fallon wrote the introduction to that Alec book in 2012, in which she said, you know, we were setting out to put uh, Oklahoma on a glide path to abolition of the state income tax. I'm a journalist, so I... I don't, I don't pretend like some do to be objective. I have a worldview, it's a conservative worldview, but I try to be fair. But my little heart was going pitter-pat, you know? We're gonna abolish the income tax in Oklahoma. We're gonna make some history. Well, instead, two years later, we got Kansas headed, to, headed down, eventually below 2%, I think. Texas with no income tax and a situation that Governor Fallon herself talked about is coming true, and that is that we're in an income tax sandwich. We're giving incentives for people with resources that generate income year to year, not, not uh, passive wealth, but active wealth. We're giving them incentives to, as generations have done, either go to Texas or now to go to Kansas. So I hope an income tax is forthcoming, and it's no surprise to anybody. I write about it. I'm fair to the people I don't agree with. But <clears throat> the sooner we can get that income tax as low as possible, and I recognize you need to look at it as part of a mix of funding sources. We have to be realistic, because otherwise there would be pressure to drive up property tax. But I sure hope... Oklahoma gets on that path and does so quickly. And I really, I have great affection for Mary Fallon. I've known her for a long time. But I don't know who is watching the evidence when they say that she's cutting taxes. <laughs> Our government has grown $800 million in three years. This is a fact. This is the truth. This is not a lie. I'm not making it up. You can go look it up. $800 million. And the $188 million you hear about being a hole in the budget, total government receipts are slightly higher this year than they have ever been at any point in Oklahoma history, including just before the Great Recession. Now, if you tinker and adjust for inflation, okay, then you have some good arguments. Put in raw dollars. We're not talking ancient history. 
talking 2007, 2008, and then today, our government is collecting more money than ever. And one of those processes I was talking about earlier is what you do with your collections. And some of our collections go right off the bat to certain purposes, some of which Charlie and I would agree with, some of which you might not. All right? It's how we make some payments on pensions. You know, there's special funds like the 1017 fund. You know, you can be for or against that particular expenditure. But more money is going to those special purposes. And then on top of that, you have all the things David Dank's been working on for years. The uh, various um, set-asides or incentives or whatever you want to call them. Some of which you'd like, some of which you might not. But by the time you add all that up, more money than ever is going to our state government. That's before we talk about our localities or about the feds. That is the truth. So, I'm kind of hoping Mary uses a campaign year to fulfill the promises she made in 2010 to cut government and spending. Right-sizing government, I, it's a great line. You know, I, every now and then with kind of a smile on my face, I ask her, you know, could you give us an example of you know, recent right-sizing of government? And she's a pleasant person and she'll talk about stuff that's a couple of years old now, some of the Jason Murphy legislation, you know, things like that. Two last things that I've worked on recently, and then we'll take your questions. <clears throat> this falls into the category of sobering data. You know, statistics um, tell the truth, and you know the old saw about liars and statistics. The data is the data. Well, here's some data. In Oklahoma City, in the public school district in Oklahoma City, we currently have seven recent recipients of school improvement grants, SIGS, S-I-G-S. -S. The total, it's funded by federal money, Title I money. The total spent at seven different sites since fiscal year 2011 is $27,566,250 at seven sites. I can give you all those names if you want them. Of that $27.5 million, $7,907,380, you can look it up, has gone to professional services, being the people running the programs. Another term you'll hear for the SIGS, School Improvement Grants, is uh, the turnaround efforts, you know. I'm all for turning around our weaker schools, but here's the data. The only school to show improvement is U.S. Grant. They've gone from a C plus on the state's evaluation to a B. All right, from a C plus to a B. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Centennial High School has stayed flat at a D. Now let me pause for just a second. If you accept the argument that the A to F grading system is tougher than what we were doing under the old school standards in Oklahoma, which it's an argument, you know, we can have that discussion, then you might be able to make the case that they're doing something better than holding their own. But at the other five sites, performance has declined from a D to an F. And those schools are <coughs> Douglas Middle School, Oklahoma Centennial Middle School, Moon Elementary, Scheidler, and Roosevelt. Well, we posted that story last night on Capital Beat OK, and in the news business, that's what we call a conversation starter. <laughs> conversation starter and intend to follow up on it. Let me give you a couple of reflections. All I had to do was work kind of hard at reading numbers, data from several different places online the, at the Oklahoma State Department of Education and checking it against uh, the school district records, and I was able to do that story. 
This is Sunshine Week. And when you hear your favorite liberal journalists talking about Sunshine Week, pat them on the back. Because they're right. They're just in enough of us. <laughs> There's not enough of us. There used to be when I was in my prime at the Oklahoma, 90 to 2002, the press rooms, plural, broadcast, Sally's familiar with what I'm talking about, and so are a couple of the others. The broadcast room and the print room across the hall were full. Now, they're full during session, legislative session now. Year-round, Associated Press, one. Daily Oklahoma, one. Tulsa World, one. And me. That's four of us that are there year-round doing the best we can, you know, to pick and choose what you're going to cover. And that's a hard thing. But sunshine provisions, transparency provisions, enable us to do what is, I believe, the inherent right, if not God-given, certainly close, of people in a free society to check up on what their government's doing. All I had to do was kind of work hard and smart with data that's already online in order to do that story that's the, what I call, conversation starter. Now, my last thing, <clears throat> this week at the Capitol, an old buddy of mine from those Washington days, a man named Tim Tardibono, his mother's uh, uh, been active um, in, uh, which town, War Acres? War Acres was mayor of War Acres for many years. Well, Tim and I worked, <clears throat> overlapped for a while working for Wyrick back there in Washington. He's a very good man, and he's reestablished a permanent, ongoing presence, as of just days ago, a think tank, Family Policy Institute of Oklahoma, and it's to try to bring, I'd say, Washington-level data analysis to family policy issues. They put out their first paper this week, and I was blessed to have the opportunity to talk to Tim and some of those that came and stood with him at the launch. Despite the stress that Oklahoma families are facing, for quite a while now, a couple, three years, there has been a full-time group, think tank side anyway, devoted exclusively to these issues. The Tim's premise, it's one I agree with, is strong families will always matter. They still matter, and they'll always matter. And the data shows, indisputably, and your liberal sociologists will agree if you're having coffee with them, you know, and you're looking at the same data. They'll agree with what I'm about to say. Children, young people, growing up in intact families have lower percentages, dramatically so, of abuse and neglect, poverty, low achievement in education, teen sexual experimentation, and substance abuse. Those are facts. Those are facts. That's, that's what the data shows. So what Tim is going to try to do is methodically make the case, both with moral suasion and argument, but also with information as to why policies that support couples in raising their children in an intact marriage uh, is good public policy and government should be supportive of that instead of standing in the way of it. Doesn't necessarily mean, our liberty friend that was talking earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean, it can sometimes, proactive legislation. But the first thing we ought to do is get government where it's not impeding family formation and uh, families staying together. All right. Uh, with him that day were Senator, and I salute them, were Senator uh, Rob Sandridge and Representative Tom Newell, uh, Representative Lee Hall, and Ma Representative Mark McCullough. So I'll be writing something about that. I've got all the information. just have to sit down and write it this weekend. With that, and also Clarence Hill with eye to eye. I don't know if you've ever met him. Big, tall, skinny, black man with a group called Eye to Eye. And what they are is a, a quintessential example of a church, faith-based, private sector reaction 
to the bad statistics on marriage and divorce. Their whole commitment, they'll work with anybody, but obviously he's you know, very interested in trying to keep marriages strong and intact in uh, the black community, and that's what Clarence does. And then Melissa Zimmerman with Bridge Builders. She, th those two people were also there. It was a good press event. I wish it had gotten more coverage, but at least I'll be writing about it. Okay, questions? Anything you want to ask? Bob's in charge of that. Okay, to Phil Donahue. I'm Phil Donahue. Okay. Questions? Okay, I want to ask this, I'm Carlene. I want to ask you about watchdog.org because you didn't mention that, and that's such a fantastic organization you're a part of. Okay, I've got, I, I set an introduction that Bob didn't use <laughs> because he gave that personal testimony, which I appreciate. My hats are, I'm the bureau chief for watchdog.org. I'm the editor of Capital Beat OK. Both of those are online news operations. Watchdog.org, everything I do for Watchdog.org also appears at Capital Beat OK. Watchdog.org is a national, libertarian to conservative leaning think tank, 501c3, supporting journalism. Everything I do for Watchdog also is posted on Capital Beat OK. Capital Beat OK, which I started in uh, 2009, is a bit heavier on state stuff, state exclusive, you know, state specific things. Then, out of those two, you'll often see, I often joke, I'm the conservative editor of a liberal newspaper, and that's complex. <laughs> and you'll often see my stuff uh, reprinted in the City Sentinel, but you'll also see it in the El Reno Tribune. Tulsa Beacon, uh, Mustang, one of the Mustang papers, I forget right now which one, and occasionally others. So we provide that stuff at no charge because we're 501c3 and a lot of people pick it up. So Watchdog is in now a full-time presence in about 15 states and another 25 sometimes. You know, we have rovers, people that cover uh, like in Texas, for example. We've got a guy who covers some Texas issues and then also writes national stuff. Just started a bureau in Mississippi. Uh, our bureau here, I was affiliated from the beginning with Franklin Center, which is the parent <coughs> of watchdog.org, and that was 2009. I was affiliated with them, and I joined them as a uh, you know direct project in 2011. What's our thing? Waste, fraud, and abuse. I don't know how to, I wouldn't know precisely how to categorize that 27.5 million. It's at least inefficient. <laughs> and you could say that uh, fraud, maybe, but it's, it's certainly not efficient. It's not a good expenditure of government funds to have that little return on spending a lot of money. So we just try to pile all that information out there and uh, shed the light in some dark corners, and a lot of it we do online. You know, uh, one of the things I'm going to be working on very methodically is misuse of SNAP dollars. I'll be working on that. Yeah. Kind of got a template that the national group... Now, I don't think... It's going to be as dramatic in Oklahoma as it is in some states, but it's there. Money being used for lots of things other than putting food on the table for the kids. And uh, there's some of that at least, and we're going to try to be, rather than just bent and yell and scream and holler, put some numbers on it. And we have a project underway to do that. Next question. Question. Paul. Oh. <clears throat> By the way, we've thoroughly enjoyed having Pat with us with 28 legislators in Israel. It was a real joy to, uh, to uh, have that experience with. Uh, Pat, my question is, the uh, I believe the House of Representatives is the conservative engine in this state. Uh, the Oklahoman uh, frequently, uh, their editorial board, 
uh, ridicules the House, some of our members, especially when it comes to Common Core or bonds, going in debt with bonds. I mean, they've been beating that drum for forever. And there's some kind of marriage with the Oklahoma and Tulsa world. I guess they're sharing some uh, reporting responsibilities. My question is, with the uh, the various other sites that are available out there, I mean, I, every day I'm reading McCarville's report, but I'd like to know how effective uh, you think the Oklahoman is in their editorial board and their statements, uh, especially in light of their circulation. I know historically it meant a lot to me when there was an editorial either for or against one of my bills. Uh, I just don't know how effective they are today, and I'd like to kind of get your, uh, your well, understanding of that. First of all, I'm a big First Amendment man, even if I don't share every conclusion, you know, that a newspaper reaches in an editorial or any journalistic entity. More power to them. They're, they're saying, they're calling things, I believe, in, a, in ways that they think, you know, would be best for public policy. I'm still the guy that Edward L. Gaylord brought home from Washington, you know, because he wanted a Reagan conservative who would be active rather than reactive, who would be proactive rather than reactive. So in my years there, we tried to set the agenda. Now, having said that, we only voted, we only endorsed all Republicans once, in 96. It was a couple of close calls, but at the end we endorsed Every person we endorsed in the 96 election cycle was a Republican, and it, we paid a price, you know, in relationships. But that gives you a, for instance, every other year that I was there for 12 years, there was a Democrat somewhere. You know, like I remember when Bill Anatubby ran for Congress as a Democrat, and there was like three candidates. He was the only one that was pro-life. Um, he and Edward had known each other for years. I sat and talked with Edward and said, not for the general. We'll make it clear it's just for the primary. And uh, Edward said, go ahead. So we endorsed Bill Anatubby. And that's an example. You know, newspapers use their um, First Amendment-based right to express their opinion. Rather than criticize a specific entity, I will say that when the Gaylords faded from the scene, I'm glad somebody like Mr. Anschutz stopped, stepped forward because I would have been afraid of us being picked up, the Oklahoman being picked up by a national chain who would be clearly liberal and would give you even more headaches. Yes. You know? okay. It happens all over the country, it's been happening. Whereas my view is, it's kind of like front page editorials, you know? I go back to the days of when I was a young man, I remember when Bill Lowe and Ed Gaylord were the only ones left doing front page editorials. Mr. Loeb up there in New Hampshire was very conservative except on union issues, and that's a long story. But Mr. Loeb, he had a theory which, you know, had a lot of working people out there, and if you want them to know what your opinion is, just go ahead and put it on page one above the fold so they can read it. Uh, I support bigger. I wish there was a lot more passionate, multi-issue, conservative voices in American journalism, but, you know, I can't unwind the clock. Are they effective? Let me give you some social, sociology and social science and political science. Newspaper editorials are most effective on ballot propositions and in primaries. That's when they're most effective. Um, not as effective, and in extreme low turnout elections you know, like below 50%, below 40%, below 25%, like a mayor's race for Clinton. That's when editorials are most effective in moving and shifting public opinion on things where people vote. On the legislative process, it's a little more complex. Um, what I say is that I believe the way to be effective is to have a clearly expressed opinion that's respectful of differing views and express it over and over and over again. That's what we did in the right to work fight, and that's why we won it. I wasn't alone. There were other newspapers involved in that particular fight. Now, I hope that's somewhat responsive. I think they're effective 
without a doubt in primaries and on ballot questions when they choose to speak. And beyond that, it gets so subtle, it's hard to measure, but you have a sense that over time it has an impact. There's just not enough conservatives in journalism, and I wish there were more. Pat, on, in your personal opinion, other than the, the blogs and the papers that you write for that are picked up, do you think that in Oklahoma City, or maybe even the whole state of Oklahoma, do we have a fair media from TV, newspaper, radio, on and on? What, what's your opinion of that? Well, I should have answered earlier. The one, Another humorous way to answer the editorial question is um, Alex Adwan, uh, who's no longer the editor at the Tulsa World, but was one of the liberals in Oklahoma journalism who could not have been kinder from my first day back in the state. He knew exactly everything about me, <laughs> having been a voracious reader. And Alex described a species of editorials that you sometimes see, including at the Oklahoma, including even when I was there. And that expression is, we have friends that are for that, and we have friends that are against that, and we always stick with our friends. <laughs> great great so, answer. Now, what was, I, I'm not going to neglect, what was the other question that I didn't really finish? I think you did a superb okay. job of that. I mean, just superb, and I really like that and, last You know, one. the guy that buys the ink yeah. is entitled to give direction. <laughs> there is a tradition in American journalism of conservative owners, and Edward L. Gaylord was not guilty of this, there is a tradition, however, of conservative owners muting their editorial page in response to pressure from their newsrooms. Growing up in our house with our two sons, there was a little saying that we always did, who does the pain does the same. And that's kind of what you're saying right there. By the way, this right? is my hat I wore in Israel. Yeah. Yeah. This is how we can tell where we were when we were at a museum and stuff. You like, you feel like you maybe met lost. Oh, there's Sally in her orange hat. You know? <laughs> okay, before we go to the next question, I messed up. Paul and Judy Wesselhoff celebrating 38 years today, right? Yeah. Unbiased. There's somebody in between. Them. Okay, next question. My name is Jeanette, and I I want to give you the benefit of some information and get a reaction to you. You talk about over 27 million dollars in seven schools, schools, and you talk about administrative costs of seven million dollars. Well, professional services is a little different than administrative. Well. Go ahead. Professional services and administrative costs, if these are federal grants, have to be held to 10%. So I think that you you can find, uh, you have a reason to go after that number. Well, okay. I haven't broken down by how much of that was local people doing training, which would probably, training, which would probably be parked in professional services, and that's quite a bit of it. Now, travel and the cost for the out-of-town people, that's not supposed to exceed that figure, but that's the only comment I'll make. I'll follow up. I promise. In slow motion, it might take me a year, but... <laughs> Question. Reed. Reed Downey. Yes, sir. Great American. <laughs> My question is about Common Core. Have you looked into the origin of Common Core? Specifically, I'm thinking about the relation or the letter that Mark Tucker wrote to Hillary Clinton in 1993, which I, my reading is, it's a part of the congressional record. It seems to lay out exactly what common. Is that the was. Arkansas guy, Mark Tucker? I don't know where he's from. He was related to Jim Guy, the former Jim Guy Tucker, but I'm not sure. Um, I know I do, and I've been told that before. The Common Core, I believe that its origins, because I'm familiar with its origins, way back in the Bush years, and even before when they were looking for what's next after No Child Left Behind. Uh, I'm not against the application and for the application of high tech to decision making. I'm not against a reasonable level of uh, trying to keep track of where kids were before, you know, what they learned, how they've been educated, because that's the biggest challenge. 
Sally can probably confirm this, that's one of the biggest challenges you face when you get a cadre of incoming students in your grade, your class, and the first thing you find out is, you know, five of them, maybe out of 22, can't speak English yet, or maybe more at some schools. I think Common Core was in its origins, and the reason it peaked 2009-2010, regardless of memos, at the level of the national groups and leadership like Jeb Bush was an effort to come up with, you know, to, to refuse to surrender, if you will, to the dynamic of the inner cities and the failure of American public education. I believe that's how it began. Now, we never succeed with one-size-fit-all programs in America. They don't work. There's no work. That's why uh, there's specs, but an interstate in Oklahoma is different than an interstate in New York because you're applying, you have a different kind of terrain, you know, the Appalachians are different than the Rockies. Well, Frank Keating used to say very powerfully concerning right to work, why is Texas doing so much better? The same people, same air, same water, same wind. And they're ahead in all these benchmarks because of all the of several factors, including they have a right to work. So that's a persuasive argument. On the other hand, Main Street in uh, El Reno or Main Street in Clinton is a different kind of place than the waterfront in San Francisco. And that's okay. It's a free country. You know, within reason, it's a free country. And I don't know how we got off on a track of assuming that we could design curriculum. And I'm, I'm an educator, certified in 12 areas, all right? Uh, I don't know where we got the idea that we were going to be able to design a curriculum at the national level that would work on the waterfront in San Francisco and in Clinton. Now, without berating anybody, without questioning anybody, you know, on an issue like Waiting for Superman and that, that film, that was Gates' money. God bless him for getting that movie made, producing it, providing the resources, but then on the flip side, you know, had the same director as um, Al Gore's thing. Yeah, the global warming movie, you know, uh, Inconvenient Truth. <laughs> Yeah, that's sort of an ironic title now. Yeah, right. Try to take things one by one, so a position is being staked out in Oklahoma. The Oklahoman was the other day not irrational in pointing out, hey, you know, ironically this may mean loss of resources more, and potentially more federal control. That's part of the battle of our elected leadership is to address that issue. The only thing I can say is this war is still going on, this battle, this confrontation, because it, at its most essential level, if Joe Dorman, maybe because of sympathy to the teachers' union, winds up at the same place yeah. as something on something this significant as Jeff Hickman and the majority of the Republican caucus, something's going on. Yeah. And it's not black helicopters. It's not conspiracy theories. It's concern. It's worry. It's frustration. We used to say, when I was a teacher, that one of our frustrations was the flavor of the month. Well, you'd have to say Common Core is maybe the flavor of the decade, but it doesn't mean it's the final answer. There's is, that, is that, that a sort of responsive? Because I don't want to beat up Janet, because, you know, at the end of the day, guess what? If she makes it through the Republican primary for a conservative, she might be the best choice. Just saying. Yeah. We'll see. We'll, we'll let this play itself out. Ne next question. But before I do go to the next question, there's a there's actually an article in this morning's Wall Street Journal that discusses and would agree with what you just said. And it's called City vs. Country, How Where We Live Depends on the Nation's Political Divide. And I thought it was a very unique article this morning that kind of clarifies what you've actually articulated. Yeah, I, I, there was a debate at the State Policy Network meeting that was four conservatives, two on each side of Common Core, and it was one of the most fascinating debates I've ever heard. But the most interesting thing said 
in the whole debate, oh Lord, I'm going to forget his name. He's, a, he's actually in Arkansas, right next door, but he's a Jewish fellow. Um, teaches it, huh? Levin or Cohen, might be Cohen. University of Arkansas, libertarian. And you know what his conclusion was? He said, he said, I know these people, pointing to his two friends, you know, that disagree. He said, I know these people have good hearts. We've been working on education reform our whole careers together. But we disagree on this. He goes, and I got news for you. You're not going to win. People are too divided over it. They're too polarized. So drop it. And let's pick up some new, narrow reform effort like school choice where we could agree. Amen. That was his challenge to them. And, you know, they had a good answer. But that's kind of where I am. Is, I don't, what's your definition of victory? You know, it's like those World War I editorial cartoons, the poor old guy uh, uh, in the World War I type, type hat standing there in the middle of the field. And there's, as far as you can see, there's trenches and bomb, bombed out land. And he's standing there. He's the only one still standing. He goes, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of. I'm afraid that's where we're headed on Common Core. Someday, somebody somewhere is going to say, <laughs> "But what are they going to be presiding over?" <laughs> Good. Okay. Question. Okay, I'm, I'm Sally. Uh, two quick comments and then question. You really need to read Mark Tucker's letter because this is more than just helping poverty ridden. This this is control. And Mark Tucker's rec uh, letter is excellent. Second, uh, as far as the media. Uh, in, in my 10 years as a legislator, legislator and being interviewed, I can't think of one story where they were objective. Uh, but anyway, they just, I'm the politician they love to hate. Uh, my question is, and it's still in Except me. When I except you, that's right. Bless years, your heart. Three years ago. Okay, we can't have a pity party here. No, we're not this. This all takes a drop. Okay, you know, for the life of me, I cannot figure out why... Mary is so bound to Common Core. It has, it, 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 and, and that's that's what I want you to comment on. You have some theory of to why you think she is. It, is it just because she's chairman of the NGA? Is she wanting to become vice presidential candidate? Is it all about the money and all that? What, or is it a combination of thing? I for, I know she has a, a, she cares about kids, but she is absolutely blind to the fact that Common Core is developmentally inappropriate for children. It's a very that, legitimate issue. That, that, that it is going to increase our taxes eventually because there's no way we can afford to implement everything Common Core wants to do with all of this technology without raising taxes. Okay, now, <laughs> Stan Evans, Stan Evans, who is a fellow conservative, for a long time he was the editor of the Indianapolis Star. He now runs a National Journalism Council called NJC, conservative in journalism, and he's, he has something he called Evan's Law, and Evan's Law is as soon as one of our people gets in a position where they're able to do us any earthly good, they cease to be one of our people. Another one is Sobrin's Law, which is even more of a favorite with me. Again, a journalist. Joe, he actually ran for vice president. He's so hardcore, and he's remained my friend. But he ran for vice president on the Constitution Party ticket. And we wow. still were friends. Only thing we fundamentally disagreed on was Israel. Uh, and that was a pretty big disagreement. But Joe had a saying, it was Sobern's Law. And it was this. And you can apply it to Common Core and maybe some other, possibly some other NGA things. And it's this, Sobern's Law. The actual ultimate result of every major liberal social policy initiative of the 20th and 21st century is always much worse than the initial overwrought, over-the-top, excessive conservative rhetoric predicted. Think about that. Look at the bills. Look at the debt the gentleman talked about earlier. Anybody want to know why for about four years about every third article was on pensions? I'll get back to it eventually, except that it's too depressing to look at the pension debt. Eleven and a half billion dollars, that's the low end estimate. I think the figure that gentleman used earlier is the estimate of the number from uh, State Budget Solutions. They're the, they're the guys that make Pat look moderate on uh, debt and pension issues. They're real high end in their estimates. But whether it's eleven billion, 
which is what our state government says, in unfunded pension liabilities. Or it's the $47 billion that state budget solutions projects. Well, okay, let's get rid of the 11 and a half for starters. Then we're dealing with 25 to 30. So, okay, what happens when you get in government, especially in an executive position, is you either do like Pete DuPont in Delaware, who was kind of a moderate liberal in Congress and was a conservative as an executive. Because when you're the executive, you're in charge. And does that mean you're in charge? Or that you listen to what is? What's, what does any conservative governor go into in this day and age? What is? And what is, <coughs> is spending, little cubby holes, you know, the reserve funds, which is actually good to have a small reserve fund. But if you're, you know, asking for pity because of the lack of money to feed children and then it turns out that you have X hundred million dollars cashiered away, it's not irrational whether you're a left winger or a right winger to say, well, could you explain that to me? Why you're keeping all that money and we're not using it? So, at the end of the day, the question is, what is she willing to do? It's like the question uh, Sean Connery asked in the great untouchable scene, remember? With uh, Elliot Ness's character played by uh, Kevin Costner. What are you willing to do? And then he confronts him with this whole sequence of events. And it's not a perfect analogy because it's violent. But it's polo in politics, what are you willing to do? Well, I've seen one president in my lifetime that fundamentally changed part of the discussion, only part. And that was the tax question, and that was Reagan. Because he was willing to say over and over again, 30%, 10% a year, well, thanks, Tip. No, I'm not willing to negotiate on that. I think I've got the votes, and I want 10% a year, three years in a row, and then we have a new upper end tax level. You have to be willing to do that. I'd be perfectly happy with a quarter percent as a conservative, as long as it's every year till we're down to a very low. Does anybody remember what was the maximum tax when the Fed started federal tax, income tax? 1% was the max. Yeah, they had graduated tax, but it was Nothing on the poor, up to 1% on the wealthy. What happened? This is America. Could you imagine Benjamin Franklin? And again, Franklin, you know, kind of a deist. You know, not, not as hardcore as a lot of the, uh, of the founders. But still a guy that, you know, at a critical moment in the Constitutional Convention, when everybody was ready to strangle each other, he said, Hey, Mr. Chairman, can we have a moment of prayer? Okay, Benjamin Franklin. Let's take somebody that's maybe from the, a different place than some of the other founders. Could you imagine what he would say if he came back in time and saw what the government takes in taxation on middle class people like me and my wife, let alone what it does to the wealthy? How could we finance the revolution? If the government of Britain had gotten away with the kind of taxes we have in America now. Okay, now I'm rocking and rolling. It's <laughs> <laughs> all being filmed, but i got to watch it. You know, in your fair and an unbiased opinion, do you believe that we ought to sell the Indian Culture Center? What should we actually do with that center? Indian Culture Center, out there at that mountain. Oh, I don't know. I'm, uh, here. Okay, I'm going to tell another story. Mr. Gaylord, back in the day, it was about 92 or 93, and we were sitting in the new building that, you know, they're selling and they're coming back downtown. And he said, what we ought to do is get all the tribes together and build an Indian cultural center with private money, tribal money and private money, 
And he said, yeah. the perfect place for it is right across the road from the Cowboy Hall. He said, Dad, can't you see it? You got Buffalo Bill up on his horse. And across the way, you got an old boy with his bow and arrow ready to shoot him. <laughs> he said, wouldn't that be great? Well, that was his dream. It was a rational dream. Some of the tribal leaders were for it, but they couldn't get together. And so here we are. And we're arguing over... You know, what it, what's, Mike, what is it already? 120 million. 120 million, that's the state money. No, that's combination oh, everything. Yeah. Okay, so the point is, you know, I wish somebody would have built the original structure, and then they want to work the angles on the equivalent of TIFs and things like that, that's part of the equation. But private money to start, if they were really coming to everybody, and saying, another 20 million, we will finish it. Period. End of conversation, it'll be done. You know, that might be within the ballpark, except even then, the, the expense. When do we, it's like, uh, maybe it'll be a masterpiece. <laughs> like Michelangelo, you know, the Pope kept asking him. And that's actually from the history books. It's not just in that uh, novel and motion picture, the agony, the ecstasy. For 20 years, when will you make an end? He keeps looking up at the ceiling and he says, when I'm finished. <laughs> and when he was finished, it was a masterpiece. Well, we all kind of worried about the original maps, let alone the one since then. But the original maps, you know, people were kind of, oh, yeah, I don't know, you know. And then the ballpark opened. And even I, I didn't like the canal. And, you know. Now it's kind of cool, you know, it's conversation started with outsiders. So it was the classic public-private leveraging private dollars with public investment. Does that mean every iteration of maps is right? Is the original maps an argument for the Indian Cultural Center? Time will tell. And uh, I, guess I, I guess I don't want to see it sit there vacant. But I still think, uh, Pat McGuigan, you know, okay, looking at the camera, I think Bill Anatubby, yeah. and, um, God, what's wrong with me, the head of the Choctaws? Smith. Who's the head of the Choctaws? There's about five tribal leaders. It's not just the five civilized tribes. They could say, oh, man, enough of this. Okay, here's the money, finish it. Yeah. And we'd all cheer them. State still would have an interest. The state would still have an interest because of past investments. But it, it's uh, Greg Treat's position is a very understandable one. Greg's not reflexively an againer, but he's dubious about this project. My friend Kyle's for it. Now Kyle Loveless. So um, I have friends that are for it. And, Friends that <laughs> no, I, I would probably vote no. That's just me. You know, you mentioned you one mentioned, man. You mentioned both of those two senators. I believe it was last Sunday, but it could have been the previous Sunday on Flashpoint. They debated that issue, and I thought actually Senator Greg Tree did a great job of articulating the points that, of why we shouldn't do this or what we should do or whatever, and how hard diligently he's been working over the years. I believe for the last three years to work through that. and But the problem with it, it seems to me, and we can kind of jump this to the next question, it's kind of like we had at high noon, we had Dr. Woody Sanders down here. That's oh. one of the, yeah, one of you, as you probably know who he is. The, the guy on the convention center. Exactly. He's, in. He's smart. S same kind of issue. I mean, you know, it's not that I that I just totally disagree with them. Emotionally, I may agree with it, but the facts do not prove themselves out on the cost of the buildup. Well, and he's a good, that's a very good example to mention, not only because of the issue, but because he's a urban planner, you know, which, you know, conservatives and libertarians feel about urban planning. But that's what he does. And he reached the conclusion that some decades ago, a couple of decades ago, that stuff stopped working. So if we're going to do something, let's at least leverage something that makes sense. Now, I said what I said earlier with all due respect to Blake Wade, who I've known for years, and to Kyle, who I've known since before he was elected, but you asked, now I'm convicted. 
And I said, if I was up there, I'd vote no. Any other questions? Pat, thank you very much for coming to High Noon Club. Thanks. 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 I want to tell you one story that a handful of you have heard, and I think it's instructive. On the day of his greatest triumph, which was early in his administration, and that's another reason I'm frustrated with, I love Mary, yeah. the reason I'm frustrated with her is if you're going to model on Ronald Reagan, then model on Ronald Reagan, yeah. you know, because he got that tax cut early and then, you know, fought his way through for another seven years. Well, anyway. On the day of his greatest triumph, passage of the income tax in the House, where he not only beat Tim, he got one-third of the Democratic caucus to vote with him, and all but two or three Republicans. So Tim sitting at his desk, and I actually heard O'Neill tell this story. And there's variations of this in the history books, but this is the story I heard as best I remember it. We didn't have cell phones in those days, you know. We had direct lines. Anybody remember direct lines? The one that rang right at your desk? Tip sitting at his desk. Tip O'Neill. No, no, no caller ID. Tip O'Neill. Tip, what are you doing right now? And he goes, Mr. President. He goes, oh, call me Ron. And he goes, how can I help you, Mr. President? <laughs> and he said, you want to have a drink? And he said, Mr. President, that would be very pleasant. He goes, will you go outside and at the bottom of the steps, the limo is waiting for you. So he gets in the limo, they take him up to the White House, and one of the real human beings that was turned into one in that movie about the butler, one in that sequence of guys, old Navy Stewart was there, and of course he was a good Democrat, and he walks in and O'Neill tips his nods his head like that, and Reagan looks at the guy and he goes, kind of shakes his head, and goes, good evening, gentlemen, enjoy yourselves. He leaves. Reagan goes over to the bar, and he goes, Irish on the rocks, isn't it? He goes, yes, sir, it is. So he makes some Irish whiskey poured over a little bit of ice. He says, I'm a bourbon and sweet guy myself, which is bourbon and seven up. So he gives Tip his drink, and they sit down, and they start talking. And Reagan, in that meeting, Reagan tells a story that's not the last hurrah, but it's kind of like that, where somebody's, and it was from some old movie script, you know, that nobody remembered except him when he had every word memorized, where this politician reaches the pinnacle of power and then has a collapse, loses power, has health problems, one thing or another, and then starts to come back, and then passes away. So Reagan's telling the story, and he turned the ice in his drink like this, and he says, that's the way it is in our business. We all have our days. So O'Neill tells that story later, and he goes, oh, this guy on everything. Everything. And to wear power so lightly. And on the day of his greatest triumph, he has a drink with me. It really impressed him. That's why, at least on foreign policy stuff, and on a few other things, they were able to work together. So we keep winning arguments. Sorry. We keep winning arguments and losing governance. And governance is closely related to elections. But it's not identical. Reagan never really separated the two, although he understood the... I talked earlier about process, that the process of the two was different sometimes. So we're winning elections and then losing the governing. And that's a different kind of skill set, and in some cases people can do both. Uh, that's our greatest challenge as conservatives, liberty guys, libertarians, who I think should still be in the same coalition just like they were under Reagan. Our challenge is to equate political electoral strength into the process of governance. The reason I'm in journalism is that I took my own advice when I wrote my book about the Bork fight. I had ten conclusions. And one of them was that self-identifying conservatives needed to be 
in the news business. Needed to be in journalism, dispensing information and dealing with people. And I don't want to be a mirror image of what people do on the left. I try to be fair, but I do have a worldview. I don't apologize for it. I share the worldview of most of you, and I thank you for your kind, rapt attention. Thank you. Thanks for your friendship. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We'll see you down there next week, and have a great weekend. Thank you.